very briefly about John chapter 15 and what it does not, what it is not talking about. If you will remember where we left off in our um, in John chapter 14, who is around him right now as far as um, the audience that he's speaking to? Judas. Yeah, all the apostles. Judas is now left. Um, and we see that he starts to talk about in John chapter 14, don't let your heart be troubled. Um, believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house and me uh, dwelling places. Uh, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And we talked, um, moving on down, about how even some of their unbelief was kind of coming out whenever in verse uh, nine, when Jesus said, Have I not been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? Who has seen me? Who has seen the Father? How can you say, Show us the Father? So they're still having some trouble figured out. So I say that to say this that there are some things in John chapter 15 that are kind of hard to understand. And even in John chapter 14 and throughout the book of John, there are things that are hard to understand. Let not your heart be troubled that you don't understand everything because here they were sitting in front of Jesus and they still couldn't figure it out. And so, you know, it's our job to kind of look into these things and say, what is it that, that I'm being taught here through the Scriptures? Um, in verse 25, he says, uh, These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you in all things and bring your remembrance all that I said to you. So again, I want to press on the point about who he's talking to and that this teaching that he's been doing, the helper is going to come and he's going to have a very specific reason for coming. And what was what is that reason? To guide them into all truth. To guide them in all truth or bring to remembrance all the things that they've been just taught just now. Now it helps whenever you know the rest of the story and then you go back and you remember go oh yeah i remember whenever he said this and that's what's going to happen is he's going to guide them into all the remembrance of all the teachings and everything else and that's how john was able to make such a concise um, um, memory and that it was able to to write down for us um, as we move into that uh, into 15 again i want to press who he was talking to the, the Holy Spirit was not given for the redemption of mankind. The Holy Spirit was not given so that people would know that you were saved. He was given for a very specific purpose. And as we move through John 15, it starts to come up again. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands what was stated in John 14 so we can go back and reference that whenever we do get to that point in John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, however, um, there, it, there is some error that is taught uh, by many denominations in John chapter 15, and it starts at the very beginning. Um, does anybody know kind of what John 15 is taught by the denominations? And if you talk to them about denominations, they'll go ahead. The branches, the correct. Denominational Correct. Yeah, that the the different branches. Whenever he says, "I am the vine, you are the branches," are different denominations, and that is prevalently taught. And if you have any denominational friends, they've probably heard sermons on it and stuff like that. That's why it's important to understand the context in which he's talking about, and to also be able to reference other um, other references in the scriptures, which we'll do very briefly. Um, but I want you to understand who he's talking to and what he. Um, the, the audience. He starts with, I am the true vine and my, father's, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that, that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, and he who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, as we kind of look at this and remember who he's talking to, 
and remember what their job is and we've already talked about that even in John chapter 13 and 14 what would happen much later with them and you remember whenever he said the things that you've seen you'll be able to do even greater and we know that they kind of built the foundation of the church and built the foundation of, um, of the, the preaching of the gospel so that all mankind could hear the gospel and so whenever he says this I am the true vine my father is the vine dresser. Now, this is not the only reference in the New Testament about vines and stuff like that, and vine dressers and pruning and everything else. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, reference one here uh, briefly in a second. But um, he's he's actually referring to, and I believe that he's referring to Jeremiah chapter two and verse twenty-one, where it says, "Yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed." How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild olive, um, a wild vine? And so he could be referencing that, um, but uh, again, I do know that in the New Testament, specifically in Romans chapter 11, he talks about it again. Uh, Paul references it. But whenever he says this, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and that is God's taking away, he's snipping away what? Branches that do not do what? Bear fruit. So it is their job to bear fruit. And then he goes on to say, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. If um, the every branch that, that does bear fruit, he's going to prune it. He's going to make it to where it bears even more fruit. In other words, God has a very vested interest in the work that has to go on in his vineyard. And he is... Um, the one who chooses what the fruit is, and you know. All right. So, any questions so far? All right. Let's go ahead and turn to Romans chapter eleven. back up just a little bit and start in Romans chapter 11 and verse let's start in verse um, 11 so I asked did they stumble in order that they might fall by no means rather through their trespass salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous now if their trespass means riches for the world and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. If the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off, so that I may be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will He spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you, <clears throat> provided you continue in His kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And so what Paul points, uh, is pointing here is this idea of vines and branches again. This root, this you know, main part of the tree, and then you have these branches. Specifically, he's talking about olive trees here. Now, what does he say about those natural branches that kind of come out from the uh, tree that um, is being vine dressed? Can they be cut off? Yes. And he's talking about the Jews here. And he says, so the 
you know, he, God is pruning that tree and he cuts off some of those Jews. And then you have this wild olive tree, which would be the Gentiles, and he's able to cut something out of that and then graft it into what is not the wild tree, but the tame tree. Go ahead. Mike, in verse 23, he's describing, you know, just what you had mentioned there. Right, go ahead. It says, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Right. So if they come to repentance, then they are able to be grafted back into the tree. Right. Back in, right. As you described. Right. And uh, you know, and I think that you know, Paul is probably referencing some of the teachings that we see in John chapter 15 about you are the vine and I am the branches and you have this vine dresser that's cutting and pruning and stuff like that. So I think that's exactly what Paul is talking about. He goes into a little bit more detail than in John chapter 15, just as an illustration. Um, but you know, as you pointed out, there's this grafting in and out of the tree that you can um, become. Um, later on, what we see in Christ, is, in Christ's teaching on it, is that you can be tossed into the fire. And um, so, but, Anyway, as we move through John chapter 15, specifically he's talking to the apostles, it is now expanded by the time it gets to the book of Romans, it's now expanded into Jews and Gentiles and this tree. Now, I wanted to point out this also, that if, um, if, uh, if Christ was talking about um, the different denominations where he says, I am the vine and you are the branches, which is a very common belief. Um, if they are different denominations, then Paul is actually um, teaching error. He teaches error in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, if you'll turn there, I'll read it very quickly. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree. So there can't be disagreements. All of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. So it would make no sense as to why that would be if you could be all these different denominations with different th ways of thinking and a different mind. So um, he would be uh, in error just by teaching that and the teaching if, if we take uh, John 15, uh, that view of John chapter 15. Also he mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you continue on down verses 12 and 13, he says, what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Well, the answer is no. Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And so he's saying you can't call yourselves by these names. You have to follow Christ, and that's, what, um, that's where your, your unity comes from. And that's where peace comes from also. So that's why John chapter 15, just in the context of speaking to the apostles and what will be their work and fruit, um, cannot be about the denominations. And also other teachings that we see in the scriptures do not allow for all of these different denominations and different ways of thinking in John chapter 15. Any questions or comments? All right, let's move on. I don't want to talk too much more about that and you can study that on your own. Um, but John chapter 15, again, as we, as we look at it, we see something in the apostles and, and we'll see this later on as he talks about uh, their work is that as, as people um, gave Jesus tribulation, there's going to be tribulation to them and there's going to be people who believe them also, just like there are people who believe Jesus. And then their work kind of becomes being part of this, this um, vine and branches. All right. So in verse uh, in verse six, if anyone anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. They gather them up and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. And that's what I was telling you about where we see in Christ's teaching on this that all of these um, branches that are kind of cut off because they're not uh, producing any fruit, they're kind of cast to the side, and then here comes the fire. So, and I think that we all know kind of what he's referencing here uh, in, in this. 
In Paul's teaching, we see, as you pointed out, that you can be grafted back in, but it's only through repentance and only through following exactly the teachings of Christ. And that's exactly what Christ is teaching. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away. And in verse 7, he says, this is the definition of what I mean by abide in me. If, in, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, it will be done for you. So, whenever we're asking for things, and specifically, he's talking specifically to the apostles here, what is the precursor for asking? Abiding in the Word, and that a Word abiding in you, and you abiding in Christ. All of that has to be there first. And if you do that, then you can ask whatever you want, and it's going to be given, because what is your mind going to be set upon? How much money I can make? Is that really what he's talking about? Huh? Yeah, you're, you know, it's going to be, you're, you're going to be focused upon what God wants of me. And as we continue through, we're going to see that again because he starts talking about the glorification of God in him, uh, in what he is about to do, and him uh, obeying that. And in verse 8, we'll go ahead and get there. My Father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So, fruit is a sign of what? Sign of life. Sign of life. It's a sign of discipleship. It can also be a sign of the correct fruit or the incorrect fruit. And so, Let's get into and let's kind of talk a little bit about what type of fruit is he actually talking about. Can anybody think of anywhere in the New Testament that talks about fruit? Yeah, the fruit of the Spirit. And we, we commonly uh, know that one out of Galatians. And um, that's, the, you know, and that again, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, peace, joy, long-suffering, those are the fruit of the Spirit. And notice that it says that's the fruit. It's not different fruits, but it's the fruit. And again, that's exactly what we see here is it doesn't say you know a bunch of different fruits, but that you are producing the one fruit that God uh, wishes. And um, so um, we also see, uh, let's see, some other references that I had here was... Um, In, in Isaiah chapter 61, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it for you. Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 3, uh, he talks again about uh, this planning of the Lord. He says, To grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness the planning of the Lord, that He may be glorified. So, whenever you are doing what God wishes, these are the types of things. There's no reason for you to have ashes on your head. Instead, what you're going to have is a beautiful headdress. There's no reason to mourn. There's no reason to be, um, to be worried um, because things are going to be taken care of you. And then it also says that they are called the oaks of righteousness. Now, what do we think of whenever we think of an oak tree? Yes, yeah, something big and strong, very hard, and you know something that is um, that is not easily moved. Something that you know that even if you wanted to cut it down, it's going to take a lot of work to cut down. And so um, that's what you can be called. But it says that this planning of the Lord, they, they see this, people see this, and this planning of the Lord, and He is glorified by it. And here in John chapter 15, we see the exact same thing. My Father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And then also in um, sorry here. Yeah, sorry. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 13, Paul says this, by their approval of this service they will glorify God 
because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. And again, whenever we read that, by their approval of this service, they will glorify God. And talking about whenever you put yourself into the service of God, God is glorified by that. He is not glorified by us making just a mental ascension that there's a God out there somewhere. He is glorified, however, by whenever we actually put ourselves into His service. All right. Um, Moving on down to verse 9. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. So this idea of love come, continues to come up in the teachings that we have here in um, when he's talking to his apostles, but also all throughout the book of John. We also know that first and second and third John talk about love quite a bit. So this was evidently something that was impressed upon John the Apostle whenever he was writing this, and we can kind of see it in his writing because it continues to come up over and over and over. So how do you abide in the love of Christ? Obedience. Yep. Paul, if you'll read the next verse, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in me, and you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. That's how you do it. So, you know, we 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 know of people who think that they can they can sin and hope that God's grace is there. But what we find is if you're truly loved by God and you truly love God, because that's really the question, that if you truly love God and you say that, the condition of that is that you keep my commandments. And then he also says, um, just as I have kept my Father's commandment. In other words, look to Jesus for what? For as an example. And we say that. And he taught it. And everything that the Father asked him to do, he did. Now, does the Father ask us to do different things than what he does Christ? Well, yes, he does. I mean, we're baptized for the remission of our sins. Christ had no sins. There was no reason for him to be baptized, but he did because the Father said to. And we also see that everything, him going to the cross, that's something I'm not required to do. But yet we see that Christ still did. Go ahead. Christ said he, he was baptized to fulfill yeah. all righteousness. That's correct. And all righteousness is doing what the Father asked. And if you'll remember also, He asked even the Pharisees, the baptism of John, is it from man or is it from God? And they didn't really want to answer it because they knew what the answer was and it was from God. That commandment was given by God. All had to obey it. Christ obeyed it. The commandment that they had of these different feasts and festivals and stuff like that, Christ obeyed them. All of the commandments that they have of love thy neighbor as thyself, all of them Christ did. And he's teaching them that you, you look to me as your example. I've done everything that God has asked me to do, that you know the Father has asked me to do. And then he, he wraps uh, this thought up uh, in verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, and here's why I spoke them to you. So that, you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So if you're wanting happiness and joy and peace and love, where do you look to? Look at this example. Look at his teachings. Understand that he is the Christ. And all of these things John wrote so that you would believe. 
listen to the teaching that's going on here. This teaching is very contrary to what we see in the world today. It's very contrary to what they you know, witnessed in the world back then. Christ goes on in John chapter 15 and maybe in the 16, um, you know, about all of these works that he did, and people still didn't believe. It. So, if you are wanting that true joy and joy to the fullest, understand that you need to keep the commandments of Christ. If you do that, your joy is going to be complete. It's going to be full. Any questions, comments? All right, well, let's move on. Verse 12. Now, this is my commandment. So he's going to give us this commandment. That you love one another just as I have loved you. Now again, he's talking to the apostles and they're going to go out and they're going to share this message. Do you think this is going to be one of the messages that they share with others? Absolutely. Read 1 John. It is full of it. And this message of uh, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. And we also see something else that a, a relationship change is starting to happen with Jesus and these apostles. Because he says in verse 13, you, or verse 12, he says, you need to love each other just as I loved you you verse 13 greater love has one has no one than this that one lay down his life for his friends you are my friends if you do what i command you no longer am i going to call you slaves for the slave does not know what his master is doing but i have called you friends for all things that i have heard from my father i have now made known to you so all of these things that he's been talking about here in, uh, since we started talking in um, Judas Leaves and then we start to hear this preaching kind of go on. All of these things Christ does and he's saying I have laid everything out that the Father's given me to teach you. Follow these things. You're no, no longer slaves to me. You are friends. And um, as we kind of see that and understand that and we understand also kind of more clearly about why Christ did what he did whenever he washed their feet he wasn't lowering himself or anything like that but he was showing humility he was showing that um, God serves God serves man and here we see that they are called that they are called the friends anybody else that we know of called the friend of God Abraham was the friend of God, yeah. Moses would be considered a friend. He says he'd talk to Moses like he would a, a friend. So God understands and appreciates whenever men do what is asked of them. And he can get to our level then and become friends. Now again, I'm not saying that this is all, we're all pally wally and all that kind of stuff because understand this, that when, um, the prerequisite to all of that is following the commandments of God. You are my friends if you do what I command you to do. Stepping outside of that, you're no longer a friend. And you're certainly no longer um, even a follower of Christ. And so you have to make sure that we understand that. Now again, understanding that this is a very narrow context of the apostles and the relationship that they have uh, with him. He's right in front of them. I mean, the question comes in, why don't you show us the Father? And he's like, I'm showing you the Father. I'm right here. And, you know, I'm doing the things that the Father asked me to do. I'm teaching those things so that you can see the Father through those things. And so what we see here is this relationship that Christ is calling them, you know, you're my friends. And, um, and we can see that, you know, as we move on and uh, how does John refer to himself in the, in the book of John? And that is the apostle that, or the disciple that Jesus loved. He showed his love towards me. He showed his love for me by putting himself on that cross. And we also see, and, we'll, and as we study Revelation, how John sees uh, Christ in that as well. So I don't want to sit here and say that 
hey, we're, we're all pals and, you know, and all that, but we do understand that whenever we are uh, followers of God, that we can be friends with God also. Go ahead. Well, in some regard, we, we kind of categorize as friend or enemy. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, yes, Very good. if we are not his friend, we are his enemy. Yes. There's no in between. But uh, even in the previous chapter, when, when he was referring to, um, they were saying, show us the Father, and he said, I'm here. Right. Just what you were just saying. But in the same token, he's teaching them that when people look at you, they should see me. Right, correct. Not you. Correct. My life is hid in doing his will, and your life is hid in doing my will. It's a, it's a, a, a it's a pattern that he's teaching. Them. Yeah, and you know, and that's where unity is. Because what the Father says, the Son says, they do, they teach. So they're teaching exactly all the way up to what the Father teaches uh, us and how we ought to be as well. And so that's how you're unified. And, um, and we'll, we'll see more of that in John chapter 17 by whenever we see sanctify them and thy truth, thy truth, you know, is what brings unity. Go ahead. You know, when you were talking about this and going back to the, the pruning of the vines, I mean, I'm not talking about the olives, I'm talking about the pruning of the vines. Mm -hmm. of all of them. Okay, okay. The reason that's done, you know why it's done, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for better growth to come up. Because the thing is that if you just let it go crazy, the final we the, the, the final we producing, you'll be sending all the nutrients out to everything you know? Right. And you get it down to like four or five or six vines. Mains, you know, they get all the nutrients and they get this a lot of fruit. Right. And you know, and again it's about, you know, getting the fruit, the maximum fruit that you possibly can for what we serve it for. And again, that's exactly what we see here uh, in that teaching as well. And one of the so the resources of that plant is the most efficient. Yeah, and, it, and you're not producing anything, and yet you're still using nutrients or resources. Yeah, you're correct. Go ahead. Back to the statement about friendship, where he says he lets them. In the Old Testament, Abraham, when he was talking, when he turned around and said, Why should I hide this from Abraham? Yeah. You don't always see that in the Old Testament. We have Elijah not knowing what's going on from time to time. But here, especially when the Holy Spirit shows up in Acts chapter 2, they get the whole picture. Right. And um, and actually, you know, whenever I was um, kind of reading this, one of the, um, of course, one of the references that we know is uh, in Romans chapter 5. In verse uh, 7, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us, and so Paul is including himself in this, in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. And again, you know, that reference, I think, you know, we could say, you know, that you're not an enemy, but you're a friend, as you pointed out, um, Nancy. Um, we see that same idea here. In other words, there's been a reconciliation. There's nothing else. Let's move on through John 15. Um, and then he says uh, in verse uh, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Now how important would that mean to, a, to an apostle that the savior, savior of mankind chose me? And you look at what these guys did for a living. They were farmers and fishermen. And, you know, and yet just regular old folks and he chose them you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain 
so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, He may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. So again, this commandment continues to show up that you love one another, and that seems to be the whole core of what He's talking about. And this is the commandment I give you. You love one another. Follow my commandments. Greater love has no man than this than man to lay down his life for his friends. And it just continues on and on and on that we could kind of continue to back up. So, and I say all of that because this love that he's talking about is a very active love. It is not a love that is simply uh, stated. It's not a love that you just kind of feel and that's it. What we see in verse 10 that Paul read, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So if you're willing to be part of that one of those branches that is gaining the nutrients and everything else that you need to sustain life from um, from that um, that tree, then you have to follow what's being stated. And that's what true love is. It is not just a feeling. It is a it is an action that you take. And it's important that we understand that because there are a lot of misconceptions out there about love. This is the biblical principle of love and what how uh, God defines love is that we obey His commandments. And it is stated numerous times just here in John chapter 15 and it is not the only time that it's stated in the, in the New Testament and in the Old. Anything else? Alright, moving on down. This guy commands you that you love one another. Um, and of course, we, uh, if we wanted to kind of reference First uh, um, John, of course, that's it's mentioned numerous times in First John um, and Second John. It's mentioned. Um, we won't take the time because we're starting to run out. So let's uh, go ahead and move to verse uh, 18. And remember what he said at the very beginning of chapter 14: Don't let your heart be troubled. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. Now, if the world is hating you because you're doing what? What's right? What the commandments of God are. That's the whole context of what he's talking about is abiding in the love and that means you're going to have to do the commandments of God. Now, we think that if we do the right thing, people will appreciate that, right? We'll be well respected for that, right? That's not how it happens. People may respect you for where you stand. They don't necessarily respect you just because of what you say. And um, we see in verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, you would love its own. I'm, I'm sorry, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. So here's this idea of love again. And in here, love is still an action. And that is that you love your own. In other words, you're not going to persecute. You're not going to hate. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. And we will certainly see that in a very short amount of time as we move through uh, the book. In the fact that, and he tells them, you're going to be scattered out. And we also see, are there any examples of any of these men that are listening to this and them just being hated by someone? Yeah, what's one of the examples? Paul. Paul? Paul being hated, but I'm talking about just these men here. The whole world. Go up with Peter. Peter being hated, yeah. Peter, John, they were they were teaching, and what happens? They were persecuted. In we and we talked a little bit about this one of our other classes, but in Acts chapter 3, whenever what happens there in Acts chapter 3. <coughs> Remember the lame man? He's the beggar. He was healed. Now you'd think 
That's a good thing, right? But what does that do? Oh yeah, circus, a zoo, a jungle, whatever, however you want to. I mean, it starts something. And are, do the Jews show that they really love what's going on here? Absolutely not. Yeah, it stirred a hornet's nest. Correct. Go ahead. If it had been simply the healing of a lame man, they would have rejoiced, they would have praised them, they would have embraced them. The issue was the teaching that they did with the crowd surrounding them. Right. And, you know, and I think you were the one that pointed out, you know, um, all of these players were there at the crucifixion of Christ and were the ones who put him on the cross. And so they've done everything they could to squash that name out. And whenever, um, in Acts chapter 3, whenever they do this in the name of Jesus, that's the issue. And I say that, and I, and I appreciate you pointing that out, because in John chapter 15, that's exactly what is stated here, is that just know that before, before, whenever the world starts hating you, just know it has hated me first. And that is exactly what we see just right off in, John, in Acts chapter 3. And that does not cease. That continues on. The persecution that starts to happen to those apostles and if you, you know, we can kind of strike these 12 down, what will happen? Well, it will all go away. And instead, it just continues to spread like wildfire. But just understand that um, the reason for that in John chapter 15 that he's telling them, the reason for that is because they're of the world. They, they see things very carnally. They, they can't make that spiritual leap and that spiritual jump that needs to happen in order to abide with God. Because God is a spirit, and he who worships God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so you have to make that ascension out, and you know it's not something that you can physically see. So as we move on down in uh, John chapter 15, in, in verse uh, 20, remember the word that I said to you: a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So, in other words, whenever they go to speak, what are they speaking? The words of Christ, the exact same thing that these people have already heard. They're not going to be teaching anything different. They already have shown that they hated Christ's word, so they're certainly not going to love it whenever the apostles say it. They're not going to be able to say it any differently. They're not going to be able to change the tone of it. They're not going to be able to change anything about it in order to make it more palatable. So just be prepared for that. And in this warning, he says <clears throat> in verse um, 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake referring back to Acts chapter 3, uh, for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. So in other words, they don't accept you, they don't accept me, therefore they don't accept what? God the Father. That's where it continues and Christ continues to point us back to. This is why I'm even here, because the Father is reaching out to mankind. And yet mankind continues to slap God's hands away. And so they are not going to listen. So don't be surprised uh, whenever that happens. And then in verse, um, verse 22, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. They could have continued on in the exact path that they were doing. But because I came and I spoke to them, there's now sin in their lives. So how powerful is this Word that came to be in the flesh? It separates mankind between the saved and the unsaved, between the believers and the non-believers, between those who are God's children and those who are not. Had He never came, they could have continued doing exactly what they were doing. But because He came and He spoke words to them, and that, that Word became manifested to them, now they are in sin. 
question is, what do we do with it? What were they doing with it? And then it says, but now they have no excuse for their sin. So there was nobody really kind of calling them out in what they were doing. And now all of a sudden, someone comes along and calls them out on their sin. They now have no excuse. They can't say, I didn't know. And that's how powerful God's Word is. Is just by speaking that you're in sin. There is no more excuse after that. And you cannot say, I didn't know. There's not going to be a judgment that comes and they go, well, okay, I didn't have time to study it or whatever. There's not going to be a, an issue with God with that. He goes on to say in verse 22, um, I'm sorry, verse 23, He who hates me hates my Father also. And they're showing that. If I had done, if I had not done among them the works which one else did, which no one else did, they would not have seen. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. So to disrespect the son and to not believe in the son is the exact same as not believing what the father has said and disobedience to him. And he goes on to say that these um, these haters of God and things that are right. All of these things have been spoken to them. That's why they are convicted of them. And also, what do we see else that he points to? Well, no. Well, yeah, they have without cause. But he also points to... The prophecy where they would kill him without cause. Right. But he's pointing to the signs that he's done also. All of these things have been have been done. Um, and uh, just kind of looking back at some of those things in John chapter 3, man came to Jesus by night. And just, and I'll just kind of look at these little snippets. Man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. They admit that. And yet they still don't do what God has said. We also see in John chapter 7, and verse 31, yet many of the people believed in Him. They said, when the Christ appears, will He do more signs than this man has done? We also see in John chapter 9, and verse 32, Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. And then also in John chapter 10, verse 32, if I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. They've already admitted that the works that He does is from God. They admit that there's been no man who can do these signs. There's been no man who does as many signs. There's been no man that can do the miraculous sign of, of, of healing a blind man. And yet, in a few chapters, we're going to be reading about him hanging on the cross. We'll finish things out uh, next week. And um, any questions or comments about John 15? Go ahead, Phil. They saw us the Red Sea part. Okay. Yeah. Back then, and they still wanted to go back home, and still wanted to worship a calf, and they still didn't, they still wanted to defy God. Yeah. You know? So I think even when they know the divine is involved, there's some people that choose to ignore it and, and just live the life. There's just no fear of it. I don't know. It's something in the future they don't think about it. You know? Yeah. They don't realize they're actually fighting God. Very good. There's nothing else. I'm going to close the class out.